Okay, according to my clock, it is 10 a.m. now. So let's try and set a good example for keeping time uh, right at the beginning of the session. Um, very good morning to everyone yet again. Uh, my name is uh, Sarah Beb. I work with GIZ as an advisor. I um, have been working with uh, the Nile Basin Initiative um, for over four years now, um, and we have had a strong collaboration around topics of, of communication, but also essentially uh, media engagement in the Nile Basin. So today's uh, session is entitled Media Engagement in the Nile Basin Outcomes and Challenges. Um, slight follow-up to a session that was held yesterday um, that had more of a focus of bringing in views from, from journalists and practitioners in the region as well, um, and seeing uh, where what, what role the media can uh, and should be playing. Um, and some, some key messages came out of that session as well that I think could be relevant for our discussion today um, of how essentially the, the partners, uh, the Now Basin Initiative and its partners in the region can support uh, the media in assuming this role. Um, so we already had some themes pop up yesterday of collaborative storytelling uh, can yeah, be being very helpful in telling different angles of a story, um, scientific and fact-based coverage of now basin issues, um, but then also the challenges that come with public service media in the region. Uh, and yeah, the, the challenges that the journalists and editors also uh, face and again, some uh, some nice uh, discussion around what support is needed from the Nile Basin Initiative and again its, its development partners. So I'm sure we'll be picking on some of the discussion um, in our deliberations today. Um, we have a couple of, of questions that we want to address today, uh, which include uh, what media engagement activities have been organized uh, to date in the region uh, and what their outcomes have been. So that is why uh, we have invited um, some key partners, uh, besides the Nile Basin Initiative, of course, uh, but also a representative from, from MICT, uh, from IHE Delft, um, from Africa Water Journalists and Info Nile, uh, and from Siwi. So we're very excited for a, um, yeah, for a good exchange there. We'll also be talking about what challenges uh, have been faced, how they can be addressed, and what gaps in terms of support uh, and collaboration with media professionals and media houses in the region remain to be filled. With that short introduction, I would like to uh, kick things off with um, some opening remarks. I have asked actually my, my boss um, <laughs> to give the opening remarks for this session, just because as I say, GIZ has, has been uh, supporting the work with the media for quite a while now. Um, and I think there's there's some nice background um, on the rationale of this support uh, that, that he can give. So let me introduce uh, Dr. Malte Grossmann. He's the head of uh, what we call Nile projects um, here at GIZ. Uh, so transboundary, uh, sorry, support to transboundary water resource management in the Nile Basin. Um, he has been heading the project for how long? Seven, eight years now? Um, but it has been working in and out of the Nile Basin for much longer than that, coming up to probably, uh, yeah, close to, close to 13 years now. Um, so with that, Malte, over to you, and I look forward to your opening remarks. Thank you. Yes, good morning, everyone, and warm welcome also from my side, and thanks a lot, Sarah, for those words of introduction. Um, and good morning, um, colleagues and friends of the of the media engagement in, in, in the Nile Basin. So I'm actually honored to say a few words at the beginning of this of this webinar. Um, and as Sarah was saying, <coughs> um, this has been a process that we as GIZ in partnership with um, all the entities that are present here have been have been taken forward over the last years. And again, to recall, I mean, the Nile, the Nile Basin Development Forum in itself is one of the key elements of the basin-wide <clears throat> dialogue of efforts to, to have dialogue on, um, on, on many channels and many platforms. And, and these dialogues, they're really key to building consensus in the region 
in finding solutions to ongoing challenges and having them broadly debated. However, and this is key for, for this session, these kind of dialogues, they should not only happen between governments or experts, but more broadly between the people of the basin and of the basin countries. And, and obviously this is where the media plays a major role because the media serves as both a reflection of and an influence on public opinion in the region. So governments obviously rely on media to garner buy-in for possi possible policy choices or interventions, agreements, investment projects. But actors in government are also themselves readers of the opinions, ideas, and solutions that are presented in the media. So in relation to Nile Basin issues, the media carry ongoing developments and debates into the Basin countries' societies, as they are, for example, also currently doing with contents from this Nile Basin Development Forum. On the other hand, they also pick their opinions and sentiments from the Basin citizens. And in that process, the media do make a way major contribution to forming national and regional debates and cooperation in the Nile and preparing the ground for countries to be able to move forward um, into deeper and closer cooperation. So and in supporting this, supporting cooperation processes in the Nile, many you know, donors, development partners, international partners have therefore clearly identified media professional and media houses as key partners in developing a common story that, that resonates well with people across the borders and, and, and binds people together in this shared vision for the basin. And, and it's really also in the recognition of this role of the media that the German government and the European Union through our GSZ programs has supported media in the basin in many ways in the recent years. And, and the aim has been um, and continues to be in, to foster that network of media professionals who report on the Nile Basin um, issues and stories from across the basin and who report to, to you know, fact-based, authoritative, and also in a constructive manner. And, and I think this network of specialized journalists who have a deep understanding and also access to the key resources um, on Nile Basin issues um, has really, uh, in, in my observation, developed substantially over the last, let me say, last 10, five years, and, and has made a very important contribution to, um, to the dialogue and the representation of, 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 of Nile um, cooperation process in the media. So one of the flagships, the project that we've been supporting is, is the so-called publishing project in, entitled The Nile, which is a, a, maybe a workshop format for journalists with our partners at NBI and MICT. And I think we'll be hearing more about that um, in the next rounds of um, presentation. But what I would like to highlight is that the idea really is to give space to journalists from the various countries to come together and cover Nile Basin issues to also sometimes a different lens than only, a, a, let me say, a, a government communication PR lens to collaborate on you know, various forms of, of, of reporting about, about um, the people and the cooperation in the Nile Basin and experiment with uh, various forms of reporting or presenting um, um, <coughs> reporting formats. And another element obviously has been the Nile um, Media Awards that we have been supporting um, NBI with for, for, I think now is the, the third edition, if I'm, if I'm correct. <clears throat> but in this work, obviously, we've not been, you know, doing this alone as GZ, and we are very much, um, you know, cognizant of the valuable work that is being carried out by all the partners who engage um, in this media uh, uh, work, and I think here in this webinar they are represented by, you know, the friends from IHE Delft, from Info Nile, from CV, and I think that you know there has been a, a regular process of working together 
of taking note of these different initiatives and trying to find areas of, of, of also of collaboration and, 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 and taking note of what others are doing in the same field. So the numbers of activities with journalists have been increasing over the last years. And sometimes for me, for example, as the head of project who's observing this a little bit from a distance, sometimes also, you know, difficult maybe to keep track of all the various good and interesting initiatives that are emerging and that are ongoing. And I think that has done also one of the motivations for, for this webinar is, <clears throat> and that is what I would see as the purpose of the webinar today, is to facilitate an exchange between the main, let me say, initiatives or groups of partners who are working um, we're engaging with media activities in the Nile Basin, you know, to share experience of, of, about that road that has been taken the last, well, is it five years? Maybe it is five, five years of intensive um, collaboration and to explore you know, potential areas for closer cooperation or new ideas that could be taken forward. And so, you know, as GIZ, we have been really been keenly following all these initiatives. Um, that, that are ongoing and, and are, are really looking forward to this discussion today in this, in, in, in this webinar to hear what their ideas and, and, and experiences are. So ultimately, it's the challenge for the media to bring the different sides of cooperation out to the public, to critically reflect on both risks and opportunities and give the voice not only to government position, but the various ideas from people of the basin. Again, be it scientists, lawyers that are predominate in the NBDF engagement, but beyond that, young people, musicians, religious leaders, <clears throat> other voices that need to be heard um, in the discussion on, on, on Nile cooperation. And I think really what the challenge of the webinar today is to discuss how the partners can most effectively support the media in taking on this challenge and this role. And with these few words, let me really hope for a way interesting discussion and open debate and good insights and the hand back over to you, Sarah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Malte, for those uh, opening remarks. And yes, I would definitely um, echo the expectation for this uh, webinar and, and hope that we have some good discussion um, on how to yeah, um, better, better collaborate or in, uh, enhance the collaboration um, and support for the media in the region. I can see we have quite a few uh, journalists also um, amongst our participants. So um, yeah, I, I hope that also the questions and inputs uh, will be coming from them throughout the discussion throughout the session. So with that, I would actually like to jump straight into our uh, presentations. Um, we have a first contribution from uh, Jane Baitwa at uh, the Nile Basin Initiative. Um, she is the Communication and Stakeholder Engagement uh, Specialist at the NBI Secretariat in Entebbe, uh, here in Uganda, where I'm also based. And her work focuses on keeping NBI stakeholders well informed, actively engaged and committed to Nile Corporation. She has more than 20 years of professional experience in the area of development um, and corporate communications. Uh, most of it in international and regional organizations. Uh, Jane is also one of the colleagues that I work with um, most closely, so very much looking forward to your input and presentation. Jane, over to you, please. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Sarah. And good morning, everybody. Um, Well, talking about the media is something that uh, I really like very much because uh, I feel that the media has a very important role and uh, exchanging with them and engaging them with them is very important for NDI. So I'm very glad to be part of this um, webinar and uh, yeah, looking forward to sharing with other partners on how best we can engage with the media for the sake of 
enhancing factual and constructive reporting on now basin issues. So I'm going, this is the outline of my presentation. I'll start with the introduction and then I'll go into how NBI is, is working towards creating an enabling environment. And then finally the conclusion. Um, first of all, the goal of the of communication and stakeholder engagement unit at the Secretariat is to strengthen the impact, effectiveness and efficiency with which benefits of cooperation in the Nile Basin are communicated across the region. And with this, the role of the media cannot be overemphasized. Um, NBA has singled out the media as a channel to amplify factual and constructive narratives on Nile cooperation and Nile Basin issues. And uh, to do this, we, we do engage in continuous media engagement to create an enabling environment uh, for the media or for the journalists in the region. Um, and how do we do this? Our continuous media engagement is done at different levels. We do uh, uh, media content analysis, uh, media monitoring, we build the capacity of the journalists in the region and we create incentives for them. At the same time, we do set narratives. I'll be going into some bit of details on this. And all this we do in order to ensure fact-based constructive reporting and then informed dialogue and factual public narratives. And this is to lead into consensus building on cooperative water resources management and development. By media monitoring and content analysis. Um, well, what we do here is that we work with a farm that is this NBI in that we also do the monitoring ourselves at the Secretariat, Entro, and now Sub CU, and uh, with the support of GIZ as well. And then we have the media content analysis that is uh, that is done initially by a farm right now. And this we shall continue. The plan is to continue with this as the Secretariat. So this is to enhance overview and understanding of the coverage of issues related to Nile Corporation and the Nile Basin. So we do this so as to enhance our understanding of those issues. What are they reporting? And then to be able to better respond to the trends in the media landscape and enable factual and constructive reporting. So as we see what is the media reporting, then how can we respond as NBI? to enable factual and constructive reporting. Uh, media content analysis also serves as a monitoring and evaluation tool to assess the progress made in stimulating more constructive reporting on Nile Basin issues that is conducive to transboundary cooperation. Uh, last but not least, it's important for us to support a more targeted approach to NBI's strategic communication. So this is the reason why we do media content analysis. As you can see, it's all really aimed at supporting constructive reporting on Nile Basin and Nile Corporation issues. So how do we build that uh, and building a conducive environment for that? So I also spoke of setting narratives. Of course, as we do media monitoring, we realize that maybe some of the things are not well presented. And so as NBI, we think it's our duty and responsibility to develop corrective and constructive narratives that promote Nile cooperation. And then we place these in lead media through uh, media engagement. Uh, and recently we are also now looking at a journalist source book. And the idea with this source book is that we want to make it a, a one-stop center. It's going to be an online product, a one-stop center where journalists can find basic information about the NBI, but also as we do our media monitoring, in case we realize some, you know, some reporting that is, um, is, is constantly being misrepresented. We can provide this information within the journalist source book. So the journalists can always find the facts within the source book. So this is something that we'll be working on uh, in the next few months. Uh, the other way that we, uh, we make sure that we are working towards constructive reporting is building the capacity of the journalists. Uh, we do understand that uh, the issues that the NBI is working on or the issues that are relating to the Nile Basin are quite complex. And so it's important to build the capacity of the journalists within the Nile Basin to be able to report from a, an, an, a good understanding. 
And so our training is done at both regional and sub-regional level. Uh, this we have done with the support of um, the German government through GIZ so far. And um, we also do, during this training, we do break down technical issues. And uh, we have been privileged to have this supported by MICT. And uh, one of the ways we break down technical issues is besides bringing in the experts to talk to the journalists and then the journalists asking, we have also introduced, we recently, or some time back actually, introduced, introduced infographics. So we look at the various topics that NDI is working on. Say for example, climate change. Say for example, um, uh, water resources analysis. And we work with MICT to help us create an infographic that is easy for the journalists to understand and appreciate those issues but also we use those infographics in other different ways. Um, and during the training, we have editorial conferences whereby the journalist, uh, this is for story pitching. And again, the facilitator that is MICT um, does help the journalists with pitching the stories and seeing how best the message can be brought out. So all this is really about supporting the journalists as far as constructive reporting is concerned. Then um, the other thing uh, with capacity building is that it enables the journalists to better and enables NBI to better understand the media, what they need in terms of content and how to relate to them. Because there's one thing the media to come to us for content, but also for the experts within NBI to appreciate what content do they need and how can we best relate with them. So we also do some capacity building uh, for, the, for the technical staff within NBI. Um, the last but not least is create awareness about content available at NBI and the experts. So through capacity building, the journalists get to know what technical content do we have within NBI and who, who, are, who are the experts in there so that whenever they need more information, they quickly know whom to reach out to. Uh, these are just some of the pictures uh, during our capacity building. The, the first one on top is um, our very first workshop. This was held in 2016 uh, in Kigali. And the second one is our uh, 2017 workshop, which as well took place in Kigali. And this was uh, back to back with the Now Basin Development Forum. Uh, and uh, we find that uh, uh, having these workshops also back to back with such events as the Now Basin Development Forum, which is a science policy dialogue is very important because then bring families together uh, first help them to understand the issues that are going to be discussed and then they are able to participate within the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the forum and to report from an informed point of view. So the other thing that we do is creating incentives and uh, uh, here particularly we do have the Nile Media Awards. Um, we are, as, as you all are aware, most of the, uh, the partners here um, are aware that we are having the third edition and uh, we'll be recognizing the winners during the Now Basin Development Forum. And uh, talking about capacity building, maybe just to go back a bit, we are already doing the capacity uh, building around this Nile Basin Development Forum. In fact, today we'll be having one such webinar uh, for the journalists later on in the afternoon at 3 p.m. Uganda time. So um, here we do recognize journalists for balanced reporting on Nile cooperation and Nile Basin issues. And, um, uh, we have done this, as I said, uh, for the, we are now running the third edition. And uh, here I'm, I'm happy to mention that we do this together with partners, uh, some of them that are represented in this meeting. We have IHE Delft, we have MICT and CIWI. They've been our partners for this current edition that we are running. Um, again, to help with the constructive uh, reporting, we do, uh, each time we have an event, we do engage the media a lot. First of all, we start with the editors because we do understand that the editors do also, it's important that they understand what the NBI issues are all about. What are the now basic issues? What is NBI is about? So we engage the media initially to bring the message to them because we understand they are very busy people. They cannot easily come out of their, of their newsrooms, but we engage them and try to let them know what is happening within NBI, what are the issues that we are working on, upon, so that by the time they, they send the reporters to come to our functions, then they already have this information, uh, this good understanding of what we are doing. Then we have press briefings, whereby we bring the journalists together and 
also make them understand what we are doing as NBI and also focus on that particular event. Press conferences, uh, events coverage, and then press releases. These two are very um, are done in order to help with constructive reporting. So I now come to the conclusion of my presentation and uh, I'm concluding in by way of uh, a promise. Uh, this is NBI's promise. And uh, our promise is that we'll continue to create an environment for journalists to access a variety of knowledge, information and experts, thereby helping ensure high quality fact-based reporting. I noted from one of the presentations yesterday by Sylvester Domasa from Tanzania, saying that uh, much of the reporting, maybe the journalists uh, depend on press releases and, um, and attending meetings. But as NBI, I would like to see ourselves as a one-stop center whereby the journalists can come for any knowledge and information as well as experts on the issues that relate to the Nile Basin and the Nile Corporation. And this is to enable fact-based reporting. Um, we're also promising that I will keep the media regularly informed about issues surrounding the Nile Corporation and the Nile Basin, as well as NBI processes and activities. So these two promises are really in line with how do we support constructive and fact-based reporting on Nile Corporation. Thank you very much. This is a picture of um, uh, the, the first media training that we held in Kigali. Thank you, that was 2016. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Thank you very much, Jane, um, for that yeah, description of, of the work that NBI has been doing. And also, I think very nice the, the promise uh, of continuing and um, enhancing what is being done right now as well. So um, if there's any questions uh, for Jane, we will uh, keep them for later. I can see there's already some questions in the Q&A popping up. Uh, so yeah, please use that function um, to pose any questions and we'll address them in our Q&A session with all presenters later on. Uh, on that note, I would like to introduce our next uh, presenter. Um, his name is Dominic Lennart, uh, and he is speaking to us today on behalf of MICT. Uh, Dominic is a freelance uh, communication consultant, uh, as well as editor and journalism trainer. Uh, his expertise spans multiple fields, from setting up community radio and TV stations, producing documentaries, uh, newspapers, and online publications, to coaching journalists. He has worked in several African countries, such as uh, Sudan, South Sudan, Kenya, and Sierra, uh, Sierra Leone, on topics such as uh, conservation, food security, post-conflict uh, reintegration, migration, and uh, pro uh, proliferation of arms and water se uh, security. Dominic has been the editor-in-chief of uh, The Niles, which uh, Malte also mentioned earlier, as well as Jane, um, a publication by MICT. Uh, and it has been published uh, since October 2010. Uh, in recent years, it has led to the production of several The Niles edition in collaboration with NBI and GIZ. I believe that was uh, since 2017 that that collaboration has uh, existed. So that is also the work that Dominic will be talking to us uh, about today. And with that, I would like to hand over to you, Dominic, if you're ready. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, let me share my screen. So I hope everyone can see that. Yes, thank you. Perfect. So, yeah, I will briefly talk about the Niles, but before I do that, um, let me start by expressing my gratitude to, to the Nile Basin Initiative and, and to GIZ for this great collaboration we have had over the past few years. And as Sarah just said, we actually started working uh, with NBI and GIZ in 2017. Now, in this presentation, I will go a bit further back. I will not go too deeply into that, but the Niles has a quite long history. <laughs> and like its namesake, the River Nile, the project 
from my point of view, flows on and on and on. And I hope it will continue to do so. There is a short timeline. We actually started already in 2010. By then, the project was still called Sudan Votes, and it was basically for the general elections in 2010 in, in Sudan, and then developed into a project that was coaching and um, publishing stories around the referendum in Sudan, which then led to the independence of, of South Sudan. And by then, we had to change the name, obviously, and with in hindsight, uh, it was a quite good move to call it denials. Um, we then continued to publish stories around that. Most of you know the tragic descent of, of South Sudan into violence in 2013. So obviously we continued reporting on that, but also reporting on what was happening in Sudan. So the project came to an end in 2016. And then luckily we started the cooperation with NBI and GIZ in 2017. And since then, we have been working on several issues. What you also see on that timeline that, and Jane has mentioned that, that the Niles itself has also led to several spin-off projects. Like at the moment, we're working with NBI on, on different infographics. But besides that, we also have uh, journalism projects in Sudan, for example, Al Adwa Online. Now we are currently working on Towards Democratic Sudan. So the Niles also has quite a lot of, of spin-offs. By the way, I think these presentations will be shared with all participants and every slide basically has links to interesting articles, um, video clips. So I hope some people will have a look at it. In terms of our correspondence, like in total, we have coached so far 164 journalists and um, the height was in, 2013 where we worked with over 100 journalists and at the moment I would say actively we're engaging approximately 30 journalists that varies a little bit with rather not entirely but a good gender balance I would say. Um, here are some some interesting numbers we have conducted 23 workshops and editorial conferences um, we have, that's a funny number. So if this work ever comes to an end, I think I will become a travel consultant. We have made 500 plus travel arrangements, flights, visas, etc. cetera. Um, we have 999 plus individual coaching hours and we hosted six denials or we hosted conferences in six countries. This led in total to a publication of approximately 3,540 entries on the Niles.org. These are articles and radio pieces, although in the current project, as it revolves all around print publication, this is the primary focus. Um, we do not do radio reports anymore. Um, this articles, we don't have a perfect um, language equilibrium. It's around 2,200 English entries and 1,320 Arabic entries. And we have produced 138 videos, which you can see on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. What you see in the background is the very first Niles website. It looks still very different. And then the, the current one, which also has already come quite to an age. Now, the key of the Niles is actually the print publications. We have produced so far 15 issues and Jane has mentioned it. We're currently engaged with journalists again and we're working on the 16th issue. And the last six ones, if I'm correct, one, two, three, four, five, six, exactly. Six have been produced with, with NBIs. Um, from 2011 to 2016 in the Sudan South Sudan project, we printed 10,000 issues, each in, in Khartoum and in Juba, and then they were distributed with, with a local newspaper. That's quite different now from 2017 to 2021. These issues have been printed 800, sometimes 1,000 times, and they're handed out on, on special events like, for example, the Nile Day or the NBDF. Um, that's, of course, a much smaller circulation. However, the people it is given to <laughs> um, are key stakeholders who are involved in the Nile Basin discourse. 
the topics we're working around, I don't focus on, on the old project now that is not so interesting, but the, the NBI GIZ denials. Um, we obviously work on water scarcity, um, best of Nile reporting that was for the last um, Nile Media Awards, environmental resources and conservation. We had one very nice issue how everything is connected. We did a special edition on the 20 years Nile Basin Initiative, which was an online publication at the same time accompanied by a film. We worked on food and food security in the Nile Basin and our very last issue on dams and dam cascade management. How the work uh, goes, Jane has already mentioned this a little bit. We start usually with an editorial conference where we get input um, from experts, often from the Nile Basin Initiative itself and from GIZ. Um, we then do some individual research and ideation of content elements by all contributors and editors. And then contributors basically present their ideas. We do fine tune them, we discuss them as a team, we make sure that there are no duplications. And at the end of such workshops and editorial conferences, we usually have a rough page plan along which we then design the newspapers. In phase B, all the journalists work on, on their content, sometimes individually, sometimes um, collaborative stories. <clears throat> and we provide on the job coaching for the journalists. So at the end of the day, we really have um, uh, all stories basically go through and can be published in the newspaper. This draft PDF then goes to our partners, NBI and GIZ, for review. And if there are any necessary corrections or changing, we incorporate them. And then the final file is submitted for printing. And then obviously comes the distribution. Um, the printed issues are distributed by NBI and GIZ individually and during key stakeholder events, I have already mentioned that, and the target group are decision makers, experts and other influential people. Now, the newspaper is only in English, that was also different in the Sudan South Sudan project where we had the newspaper in English and Arabic, now we only do it in English, but our online publication, if you go to the niles.org, you will find all articles in English and in Arabic. Um, this is a little bit uh, not much, but some of the nice um, achievements from our point of view. Many of our stories have been republished by the Ar Guardian Africa Network. Um, we have been praised for our excellent content and design. And uh, yeah, people also say it's a very nice comment by the former. German ambassador to South Sudan, David Schwacke was his name, um, that it's a really impressive publication and that it is close to our heart. Um, so it is to my heart and I guess to almost everyone at, at MICT. Now, one of my last points is to go a little bit into, um, I don't want to call them challenges, these are just some reflections. Obviously, as maybe I start differently, I think a bit of a tricky part is that that we're kind of a of a mixture between publishing and and capacity building. So journalists often think we're we're really a media outlet. So then we would obviously produce a lot more stories. However, our project is really limited by by the funds we're receiving, and therefore it's usually two newspapers a year. And you can imagine working with thirty journalists. That's like for everyone in a best case scenario, two articles a week a year. That is very little, and I, I think journalists would really like to contribute more. Um, so there is certainly an output limitation in, in terms of quantity. Um, this is something where I'm surely not the only one. I have heard that in, in yesterday's session about the media, we need certainly more solution-oriented journalism. And I, I think it's also not yet understood by, by everyone. That is maybe something we can discuss later in, in in a discussion, but the depth from my point of view is, is certainly lacking when it comes to solution-oriented journalism. A bit of a pickle for myself mostly, I guess, is the physical interaction and limiting the environmental footprint. Some of you might know we have worked on a special issue about con conservation for the Eastern um, Nile Basin where we <laughs> myself obviously the worst one coming from Germany but altogether I think we were around 20 people flown from all over the, the eastern Nile Basin plus Germany to Bayadar 
and then we work on on issues such um, you know environmental degradation and so on. So I, I find that really hard to to work on such issues and and kind of reconciling it with the work we're doing. Um, now during COVID, obviously we have it completely different. We can't meet physically, and this is also not ideal, as our workshops really also serve for the journalists to have their exchanges, to get it, to know each other better, and often also to resolve conflicts or address them at least. So it's a pickle. I think, and we will hear more from, from other stakeholders, but I think we should certainly all try to cooperate more. I mean, we're all working on, on NIA cooperation and within the media sector, I think there is some sort of collaboration, but we could certainly try to do a lot more in that regard. For example, the point I've mentioned before, if we want to all reduce our environmental footprint, can we not uh, you know, co-host workshops, for example? We could do them longer um, and, and therefore don't have to travel all so often, twice a year, three times a year, and then having workshops organized by different um, organizations. I think that would be something worth to consider. Um, another point is obviously now in the whole Nile Basin affairs covering them. We have a bit of a, a language um, shortcoming at the Niles, I think. As I said, we publish in, in English the print issue and online in English and Arabic. But obviously it would maybe also make sense if we, that goes to the next point, reach limitations. Um, if we really want to, to reach many, many people in the basin with the content we produce, and I think InfoNile, for example, does that wonderfully, is to also publish stories in many other languages that are relevant. Um, let's pick Swahili, for example, French. So there are many options. I think that is something to consider. And then certainly for the Niles, it is, again, from my point of view, a very good publication. The, the content is, is excellent. However, in terms of how many people we actually reach with our content, that, that is quite little and it, and it should be a lot more. So I think that is something we all, I don't know, I'm keen to hear from other partners how, how their publications are doing, how many times their articles are read. But for us, that would be certainly something where we should try to push a little bit. And with that, I'm actually already at the end of my presentation. Um, like water funding is a finite resource, whatever the future might bring for the Niles, and I hope it will flow on, a legacy will certainly remain. And we have had that nice saying in one of our publications on, on migration, experience is a solid walking stick. <laughs> and ourselves from MICT and obviously all the journalists have really gained a lot of experience thanks to the support, as I said, at the moment by, by NBN, GIZ, and through the German Foreign Office. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this raft. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, yeah, I think uh, in interesting the challenges uh, that you highlighted at the end as well. So I hope we can pick up on uh, some of those in our discussion uh, later on, or also if some of the other um, partners want to address them in their presentations, please feel free. Um, yes, we have the next presentation um, by Emmanuel Fantini. Uh, Emmanuel is a senior lecturer and researcher at IHE Delft uh, Institute of Water Education uh, and within that in the Department of Water Governance. I hope I got that right. Um, he holds a PhD in political sciences uh, and a European master in human rights and democrat democratization. Emmanuel's research interests include uh, mainly water governance, water conflicts, the human right to water, social movements, uh, religion in public spaces, media studies, visual research methods, um, and especially with a geographic focus on Ethiopia, the Nile Basin, and Italy. Uh, he is committed to public engagement and crossover projects with artists and journalists um, and coordinates uh, the project Open Water Diplomacy, 
uh, Media Science and Transboundary Cooperation in the Nile Basin. He hosts uh, the podcasts, The Sources of the Nile and Water Alternatives podcast. And he's also the editor of the IHG Delft Water Governance uh, blog, Flows. So with that, uh, thank you very much for joining us, Emmanuel, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sara, and good morning, uh, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. It feels, it feels like being <laughs> among friends and also <laughs> um, following up yesterday's um, session on, on a similar topic. And then I was wondering, preparing this presentation, maybe is it too close this group. I mean, it's nice to be among friends, but maybe we should try to enlarge a bit the, the group, the community of practice, which is uh, that gathers today in this virtual uh, room. Um, so I'm, I would like to share uh, today um, four activities, four experience, uh, that we've been uh, implementing in our project Open Water Diplomacy, Media Science and Transboundary Cooperation funded by the Dutch Minister of Foreign Affairs. And you can think of those uh, activities as a, as a con concentric circle, hmm? like uh, from the, or in terms of audience and in terms of dialogues from the smaller audience in the, at the center, the more intimate groups or circles toward larger public and audiences. Uh, so the first experience as was also uh, recalled by uh, Sarah is the podcast, The Sources of the Nile. Um, seven episodes with journalists and researchers as guests to reflect on the role of media in water conflict and uh, uh, cooperation along the Nile River. And uh, several people in this virtual room were, uh, have been part of the podcast. You could hear the voice, for instance, of uh, Nick, who was speaking before me, Anna Vubalem, several journalists uh, that also spoke yesterday, like uh, Rehab. Um, and indeed, a uh, podcast is a, what, uh, it's called end of the tail medium. It's for a specific but interested and committed audience. Uh, one of our listeners call our podcast for a podcast for Nile nerds. <laughs> uh, and indeed, eh? so um, podcast is about voice. And I think by listening, by broadcasting and publicly acknowledging what people have to say, I think a podcast can uh, reinforce or uh, a community. And this is the main lesson learned. Um, podcasts uh, can be a useful tool uh, to create or to reinforce uh, a community of interest and practice. And for the other uh, lessons learned, I would like to uh, point to this article that we recently published with Emily Baust, who edited uh, the podcast, in which we further reflect on the um, uh, on our experience. But I wanted to start with a very intimate uh, experience, a small group, but uh, I think committed, a small community. So then, trying to enlarge a bit the group, the audience, uh, we offer twice an online open course on science communication for water cooperation and diplomacy, targeting researchers, scientists, because often we think, okay, when we, we have to do training uh, and we think about training journalists, but that's not, uh, that's only one part of this, uh, the story. If we want to uh, have uh, effectively communicate scientific, technical knowledge and, and facts, we also need to uh, equip uh, researchers, scientists to better uh, communicate. Uh, so the, the second uh, edition is ongoing of the online course. 
And as usual, also as in the previous edition, we registered a lot of enthusiasm and initial interest, more than 200 people um, registered. But then what we see on the other side is that 10 people struggle. Eh, to, it's not a big course. I think it's more, it's um, four modules, two hours per week. Then there are four optional modules if you want to engage in more practical skills. But the people eh, find it hard to uh, keep the pace, to complete uh, the course. Uh, now they start into 200 registered, and I think 50 are actively um, taking the course right now. So I think this point to me at the fact that um, communication is not uh, yet adequately acknowledged and rewarded within academia. Researchers have very little time and they don't uh, for communicating their findings to wider, uh, to the general public. And unfortunately, this is not considered yet as a priority. So we also need to think how we can incentivate, how we can reward this, um, this activity. I'm sure you have been also involved or as attending webinars that in the past month have been dealing with the Nile or with the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. And there you see how key is, especially for young researchers who are doing uh, a tremendous job uh, to learn how to effectively present and communicate their findings. So I think we need, we still need to uh, work on this. Then, uh, moving further and trying to further enlarge our group, our community of interest and practice. We published uh, with uh, SciDevNet and published by CABI in open access, a media handbook. Here, the targets are editors and journalists. It, was, it came out from um, a reflection by one of the journalists that uh, Ayaman, an Egyptian journalist that I hosted uh, uh, that was invited as a guest in the podcast. She was saying, okay, we are, uh, you keep on targeting uh, journalists who are already very much interested and knowledgeable about the Nile. But maybe it's good to look beyond those group of journalists. Think, for instance, about the editors. Editors have a key role in setting the agenda of, the, of their media outlet. Maybe editors are the one pushing for the usual, uh, the next water war titles, headings eh, that we always find in the media. You need to reach this. So we try with this media handbook, which is also combined with web a webinar and a podcast to uh, reach out and to um, involve in the conversation journalists and editors that are not dealing uh, on a daily, weekly basis with uh, with the Nile. And um, I think the, the the handbook was published end of last year. So maybe still premature to assess the impact. Did we manage to reach those uh, journalists? But indeed, if you have ideas to further promote it and to reach uh, people or people audience that you think might be interested, I, of course, we are eager to listen to your idea and uh, suggestion. And finally, uh, going uh, and trying really now to think about the big public. I guess we all share the, the feeling that social media are not helping the cause of transboundary cooperation along the Nile, especially nowadays, to put it in a nice way. <laughs> I think, of course, we still need more study on this. We need to learn how to leverage social media for this cause, for the cause of transboundary cooperation, and we need to practice. So yesterday we've been talking about emotion, stories, how emotions cannot be separated from fact. We talk about stories. We talk about the need to foreground uh, stories and experience of the ordinary uh, people. And we're working, we are trying to leverage the power of visual by working with uh, nine photojournalists uh, together, uh, thanks to um, InfoNile, 
uh, working with Nile photojournalists. They will pre are not currently uh, shooting and producing uh, visual stories that will be shared on Instagram with the on under the hashtag Everyday Nile. So I invite you to follow and to promote uh, the Instagram account of Everyday Nile and to follow those journalists. That because I think here what we really trying to do is to empower um, people through emotions. Um, yesterday, I think Vubalen make a reference to we need to promote good emotions. Eh? What, but uh, I was thinking, uh, I like that reflection, but then pushed me thinking, okay, but what is a good emotion? For me, a good emotion, a good story is a story that empower people. If I think about the the water war narratives for me that's the archetypal disempowering uh, narrative because uh, if water uh, is an issue of security is an issue that will lead to war what can i do as a simple citizen as a researcher instead we need by telling story of everyday engagement passion uh and links bondage to the river, we need to empower people by uh, telling these stories. Uh, so uh, I really invite you to follow those nine uh, photojournalists who are trying to repicture the countries thanks to the uh, artistic coordination of uh, Roger Anis and coached by Laura uh, Eltantawi, two amazing uh, photographers and photojournalists. And I invite you to follow Everyday Nile on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to see if together we can indeed contribute to change the narratives. And you might wonder, eh? this is a daunting um, exercise, uh, task, uh, no doubt. But as we are a, straw, a small, committed uh, group and community of practice, I uh, would like to conclude with this um, sentence. Uh, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And with this, I hope to elicit good emotions in the room. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel, uh, also for the inspiring words uh, there at the end. Something that also does strike me um, from your presentation is that, yes, we are definitely a very close, committed community um, of people engaging on, on media uh, in the Nile Basin. Um, and while, yeah, that can be a huge advantage in terms of getting that, uh, yeah, getting people stuck into the work, we do also have to keep thinking and asking ourselves how we can reach out to more people, involve more people in this work that we're doing. Um, so yeah, I hope we can touch on that in our discussion later on as well. With Thank you, that, <laughs> Thanks again, thanks again. With that, I would like to introduce uh, the next presenter. We have uh, two more presentations uh, left before we get into our discussion. And we're running a bit behind on uh, time. I didn't want to stop the interesting contributions uh, early, uh, but I would ask the, the final presenters to, to try and keep an eye on the clock a bit uh, and really limit the presentations to 10 minutes. Um, next up, we have uh, Frederick Mugira. Uh, he is from, from Uganda um, uh, and an award-winning water and climate change uh, journalist, as well as media trainer and development communication specialist with over 10 years of wide-ranging experience. He is the founder and MD of Water Journalists Africa, a nonprofit media group that brings together over 700 journalists in 50 African countries to report on water-related issues. He is also the co-founder of InfoNile, a geo journalism platform that maps data on water issues in the River Nile Basin and overlays them with uh, journalistic stories to promote uh, transboundary peace. In addition, Frederick uh, works as an editor with Uganda's leading multimedia house, uh, the Vision Group. 
um, a National Geographic Storytelling Explorer and, uh, sorry, and Pulitzer Center grantee. Uh, Frederick has reported from various countries in Africa, Europe, and Asia, as well as the US. Um, he has received the CNN Multi-Choice uh, African Journalist Award, the UN Development Journalism Award, uh, and also holds an MA in Development Communication, uh, as well as having studied environmental journalism. So that's quite a list of accolades there. Um, very happy to have you here, Frederick. And with that, uh, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. Uh, as you uh, identified me, my name is Frederick Mujira. Uh, founder of the Journalist Africa and co-founder InfoNile. Um, uh, InfoNile is a geojournalism project. Uh, we have about 500 journalists in the Nile Basin, you know, uh, telling the story of the Nile through geojournalism as we look at it. And uh, InfoNile is a project of uh, uh, Water Journalists Africa. Water Journalists Africa the project that I started in 2011 that you know covers the whole of Africa. We have 700 journalists uh, in this uh, uh, network uh, who report specifically about water, and they are spread across 50 countries in Africa. Yeah, so our approach at Infona is that we bring together journalists uh, in a collaborative way to you know to report, investigate a common topic on environment and scientific uh, uh, topics, you know. So in the past, we have looked at several uh, uh, themes. We looked at what are and discussed it during COVID-19. This is a project I've just worked on that involved about 40 journalists from the region. Climate Change Solutions, uh, uh, this is a project we are working on, supported by uh, National Geographic Society uh, that has about eight journalists from the region working on it and then wildlife trafficking. Uh, and conservation, but a project we have just uh, completed uh, that focused on East Africa, and uh, we had uh, uh, several journalists in this, and we trained them. We are also doing stories about uh, biodiversity in transboundary lakes, and I know we also completed a project on foreign land deals in the Nile Basin. Uh, so how we do it? We source credible data that is, you know, cross-cutting. You know, well, as you practice geojournalism, certainly you need. Uh, uh, to work with data. And then, uh, so source data, this is data from scientists. Uh, and so we have looked at, you know, uh, data about water access, uh, rainfall and runoff, and then acquisition, which helped us, you know, work on a map for the foreign land deals. Our approach uh, is that to call for pitches and then we give uh, uh, grants to journalists. We've worked with journalists and we've produced about 200 stories since we started in 2017. We mentor journalists, and uh, you know, when we give them grants, we mentor them. We have mentored about 150 journalists, you know, trained them in geojournalism. And then we, you know, these journalists uh, go ahead and publish these stories. So, so we have had about 200 uh, stories published by local journalists in the Nile, in the Nile Basin countries. So these journalists, uh, some of them publish their stories in local languages, but also we have coordinators, have five coordinators spread across the region who translate these stories. We have a coordinator in Sudan for Arabic in Ethiopia, for Amharic in Kenya, uh, for Kiswahili and Tanzania for Kiswahili, and another coordinator in, in uh, Rwanda for French. Now, so these stories, when they are uh, you know, translated, they are published in local languages uh, on our platform at infonite.org. I would encourage you to uh, look at what we do or how we do that infonite. RNG. So what we do with these stories again, we you know we bring them together and create a cross-border multimedia project. We've done this. We have about five projects which you can find out at in our site, which I've put together. And also we create you know actionable uh, interactive maps and publish them with these stories. You know, we have done over ten maps which you will find on our site. As we do this. You'd wonder why we do this. Uh, we practice geojournalism, and we think that we, we 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 can you know tell the story of the Nile in a, a, a different way. We are trying to you know defamiliarize the Nile story. We think the Nile story has been around, yes, and you know people read, and you know sometimes never take action. But what what if we bring it in a, a new form? It's the same story, but you know told in a new form, and then we think that when we tell it a new form. We, we kind of attract more audience. 
So we practice geojournalism. We tell stories with the data generated by earth sciences. And that's all, that's what geojournalism is all about. So what we do, we use satellite imagery. Um, we, 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 we get this through Google Maps, you know, Google Earth, you know, uh, uh, time lapse and digital overall. So we, we, we try to kind of, you know, make the story in, in different form. Not the usual way of, you know, writing you know, texts and then photos and then just end there. Because when we were starting one of our projects, we did a baseline survey and we found that the journalists in the Nile Basin never use data. We, we did a content analysis of the, of the of stories about the environment, you know, science for about three months and we found a few stories, you would say less than 5% of the stories that you know, we looked at had uh, you know, data. And then uh, this is why now we thought it is important for us not only to use this, but also to train journalists in the region to know how they can use data. So we, we, one of the, the techniques we do is that we use satellite imagery, and then uh, this is a you know, kind of you know, helping uh, us to uh, uh, have, when look at the effects of human behavior on an area we are, we are working on. As we you know, do a satellite imagery of a particular area, for example, if it's a dam, if it's a forest, if it is a national park, uh, this is what you do. And you, you, will, you will realize that these techniques are very important in telling uh, environment stories, especially when you do uh, being climate change. We just suppose when we are telling, these are techniques that we use in geojournalism. And so when we juxtapose, we encourage readers to make comparisons. You know, how was it before and how is it now? And then you, even the readers are able to judge for themselves. I know uh, what is happening. If, for example, you're telling a story about climate change, and you juxtapose, you will show what has disappeared. If it's a lake, you will show what has disappeared. We have used this technique to tell stories of the lakes that are you know, kind of disappearing in Ethiopia, in Uganda, and some uh, in uh, Egypt. Uh, we use drone. We've been using drone for several of our projects uh, uh, to tell the story, to defamiliarize the story of the Nile. So we, we use the drone. And you realize that when you use drone, it is a kind of a, a safer and most effective means of you know, video recording. We have used this, this technique and we actually used it recently to go to a national park and record uh, our wildlife, you know, animals. And, uh, forests and you know, uh, France, and these are areas that we would not reach. So we use uh, the drone to uh, tell this story. These pictures can speak on their own. Even when you have stories, you, know, you have text, but these pictures can speak on their own. The aerial, the aerial pictures are very powerful. Yeah, again, we use data. Uh, data is when you, you have data in your story, it kind of uh, brings out the credibility, it's easy to understand, it puts your news in context, and we use it often in our um, stories, in our projects, so that uh, you know, we can defamiliarize the story of the night. We have been mapping and uh, we continue to map. We have, have, we have had several maps. We did a map, for example, of land grabbing in the Nile Basin, which we, uh, uh, we used uh, on our sucked dry project. So this, this, this kind of uh, uh, technique also helps our readers you know, and guides them, guides them on locations and uh, to know where we are when we are telling the stories and you know, uh, put them on the location, kind of uh, locate them uh, where we are and where we are telling the stories. Uh, the last one that, uh, that we are using as a technique of defamiliarizing the story of the NAR is uh, strategic partnerships for impactful body. We strongly believe that we cannot do this alone. So we, uh, we don't go alone. We work with different uh, organizations. We have worked with uh, IHA uh, Delphi, which has supported us several times. We have worked with NBI, we have worked with Code for Africa, Code for Africa. Uh, is uh, the organization that you know uh, does our uh, data visualizations. They have several data wrangles and then, you know, they visualize uh, our, our, our data. 
we have so many that we have worked with, National Geographic, Society, Pulsa, uh, as Journalism Network, and the Internews. These have been helping us, you know, supporting us. They give us journalism grants and we give it out to journalists to work on these stories. And our main funder is JRS by the University based in uh, uh, USA, which also gave us some money to start a small office and, you know, and recruit some staff. Lastly, we are working on different projects. They, uh, one of these projects is an online platform for journalists and researchers. We realize the trust gap is kind of big between journalists and researchers. And we want to uh, bring it, to make it small. Journalists uh, and researchers are, you know, having hard time working together. Then we want to make sure we uh, put out a, a, a platform. Uh, we have reached out to several researchers in the Nairobi, and I believe some of you know about what you are doing. So we think that when we complete this platform, which will be online, we kind of give a platform to journalists and researchers to work together, to co-produce knowledge, you know, to find who and where, so that journalists and, uh, I mean, so that researchers can trust journalists and don't fear that they will misrepresent their information. You know, when you work with someone, you kind of develop that kind of trust. Lastly is the project about uh, the Everyday Night project that Emmanuel talked about, which we are working on. We have a group of nine photojournalists that we picked from the region, from the uh, from nine countries in the, in, in the Nile Basin, and we are giving them a journalism grants uh, to do photojournalism specifically. Uh, this is a project uh, supported by IHE Delphit, and we are trained. We are currently on the stage of training these photojournalists to uh, get skills in photojournalism. Then later, they will produce uh, uh, projects in, uh, with uh, about 15 photos heading the life uh, of communities along the Nile. Uh, and as Emmanuel did, I would encourage you to follow up this project at the hashtag Everyday Nile. Uh, thank you so much. This is all I have for you. Thank you so much, Frederick, for that presentation. I've also been a, a keen follower of InfoNile for a while, of course, um, and I'm, I'm sure many audience members are also very aware of the work that you guys do. Um, so yeah, I'm looking, always looking forward to seeing more and we can definitely touch on, uh, yeah, how to Thank further you. the exchange in our discussion later, Frederick. Okay. All right, um, with that, I would like to introduce our last uh, final presenter. Um, he's here with us from uh, CW. Kerry Schneider is a program manager for the Shared Waters Partnership um, at the Stockholm International Water Institute. And Kerry contributes to the development of research and project management in a number of fields, including transboundary water management, climate change, and capacity development. He holds a master's degree in international humanitarian action from Uppsala University in Sweden. And prior to joining CWE in 2013, Kerry worked for the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. So uh, with that, uh, we're very happy to have you here, Kerry, and I would hand the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sara. Uh, let me start by saying thank you to, to GIZ, to the NBI. Uh, the Nile Basin Development Forum is, uh, is a fantastic opportunity for, for journalists and, and people considering uh, Nile issues from, from lots of different angles. Uh, and we're really happy to, to support and be a part of this. Um, so let me let me start with those things. Um, you know, Siwi has been supporting journalists in the Eastern Nile since 2016. And I'll start by discussing sort of where that support is coming from, which is through a program we've been implementing at Siwi uh, since about 2011 uh, called the Shared Waters Partnership. And the purpose of this program uh, is essentially to strengthen frameworks and processes for transboundary water cooperation in regions where water is or could become a source of conflict. Uh, and with this program, we seek to provide opportunities for governments 
uh, or other agents of change to uh, engage in experience sharing, to engage in formal and informal dialogues, uh, all with the aim of contributing to the development of, of shared responses to shared water problems. Uh, the SWP is a, it's a global program that, that has been supporting cooperation in the Nile, yes, uh, but also other basins in Africa, um, the Middle East, Central Asia and Afghanistan uh, and Southeast Asia. And we do this with, uh, with support from a range of development and diplomatic partners. So uh, wh while the primary mission is, is to support and enhance cooperation, uh, the, the secondary mandate is to strengthen coordination amongst this development partner community. So we've worked with uh, the State Department and, and UNDP initially, uh, but we've been able to work uh, more closely with a, a, a much longer list of organizations, the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, the Swedish Development Cooperation Agency, CEDA, uh, the list goes on. And, and, and that function has been really important because it's given us an opportunity to, to broadcast the role that media plays uh, to a much broader group. Um, and, and as I mentioned, the, the work that we're doing is typically aimed at, at government decision makers, uh, those who are in kind of the most direct position to, to affect change uh, within a cooperation process. Uh, but CWE recognizes the role that, that media plays in water diplomacy in general. And so since 2016, we have been supporting a, a group of journalists essentially continuously throughout the, the, the year. Um, an initial workshop uh, that was conceived of in 2016 by a former colleague uh, and still friend, Anna Kaskau, uh, brought a group of journalists to the GERD, uh, the big dog. And at the time, uh, you know, back in 2016, this was not so long ago, but it feels like we may as well be speaking about the Bronze Age. Um, at this time, meteorologists were predicting uh, a decreased rainy season in Ethiopia. And there were real concerns at the time that this could be interpreted downstream uh, as a function of dam filling. And so at this time, speculation and myth were, were widely apparent in media reports. And the thought process was that to strengthen the reporting, um, Coming, coming out uh, of, of, of the entire region around Nile issues at the time, CWE organized an opportunity for a group of transboundary journalists to travel to Ethiopia and to conduct their own investigative reporting. So during this process, journalists met with experts um, uh, who discussed various aspects of cooperation. Uh, they interviewed high level managers that were working on the construction of, uh, of the GERD. Uh, they took their own pictures, they developed their own insights, uh, and they made their own reports. And I have to say, probably from, from conception to implementation, this was probably the single most influential activity that we've implemented under this program. Mm -hmm. um, you know, immediately after this workshop, within days, there were over 50 publications uh, released from print, radio, television, um, it, it, it really seemed at the time that, that everyone who is anyone who is paying attention to Nile News at the time noticed. Um, the journalists were thankful for the experience. Nile governments communicated uh, to us and complimented the coverage. They encouraged more media support. Uh, we heard from the NBI. So this meeting really demonstrated that you, you know, the incredible potential of the, the media's role in shaping the narrative around cooperation. And it also showed, I think, that, that well-planned and well-timed donor support uh, to programs like the Shared Waters Partnership can actually make a, a real difference. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, part, part of the, the positive feedback came in from Nile governments who requested that, uh, that CWE facilitate additional media workshops. So the initiative grew from what was once planned as a one-off intervention to a continuously supported network. 
There is an ambition to hold annual workshops in each of the Eastern Nile countries, uh, which we've, we've almost met. As I mentioned, the first workshop in 2016 in Ethiopia, followed by the next in Egypt. Uh, our, our most recent, which was held at the end of 2019, was meant to be held in Sudan. Uh, but, but we weren't able to arrange that with, uh, with things going on in the country, uh, but we hope to, to visit Sudan next year. Uh, and, and for us, you know, the entry point is always cooperation. I think that's the most important undercurrent um, in any of the projects, whether we're working directly with governments, uh, if we're working with media, other types of stakeholders, the emphasis is always on cooperation and the role that the different stakeholders play in a cooperative process. And what we can see is that media really plays an incredibly important role. Um, and circling back to the big picture of, of why media support, I have to em emphasize the specific role that media plays in water diplomacy. Uh, at, at the top of this slide here, this is a, uh, a definition. This is sort of Siwi's definition of water diplomacy um, as it was articulated by my colleagues, Elizabeth Yari and Martina Klimas. And this is essentially a nod to, to the lessons learned um, over the past two to three decades in transboundary water management, where it's become apparent that water problems uh, at, at the transboundary or, or at regional scales cannot you know, simply be solved by, by technical solutions alone. There's just too many stakeholders with competing uh, legitimate but competing interests uh, and working through all of this journalists play uh, this incredibly important role when it comes to highlighting and contextualizing the reasons why uh, why cooperation is is the preferable approach uh, for governments when it comes to to water resource management so <clears throat> In contextualizing all of this, um, you know, the reasons we just to take a list, this should be some familiar source material to most of the people on this call. Um, just looking at this list, you know, we can see sort of point by point. This is a good list. These are all all great reasons to cooperate. Uh, but I think for most people and especially the general public, a list like this really needs contextualization. And, and, and that's the that's the real skill of a, of a great journalist, is somebody who can take these points and, and translate them and, and make them relatable. Um, you know, so for example, what, what does the optimization of, of resources mean to a farmer in Sudan? I mean, probably a lot of, a lot of great things. I could, I could start writing my own list right now, but I guarantee you know, the, the list that I come up with is not going to be as compelling as, as you know, the, the comparisons that a journalist from Sudan who knows uh, their, their media consumers um, tendencies and, and habits and, and what would make sense to them, what's going to be personally relatable to them, um, they, they, they can do that. That's, that's their job, that's their skill set. Um, and that's what we need. I mean, and this, this, uh, these types of issues, uh, you know, can be seen up and down uh, cooperation in the Nile, um, but really in any any major transboundary river system, you know, um, a lot of these, a lot of the uh, the sort of headlines and and you know the reasons that that we urge cooperation for uh, when it comes to development projects, for example. I mean, you can take the GERD. The GERD, I think, is supposed to generate between, I can't remember, I think it's around six, between six and seven gigawatts of, of energy. I, that, that means nothing to a person like me, honestly. And I'm somebody who thinks about water problems and their solutions all the time. 6.4 gigawatts, how many light bulbs does that turn on? You know, how many, can, how many times can I charge my phone off of that? I have no idea. Um, these these are the the entry points for journalists to help everybody understand the real value of cooperation um, and and its potential i think so in order to tell these stories journalists have to wear many different hats um, transboundary cooperation again in the nile but any large river basin uh, has a lot of different elements to it 
You know, some of them are incredibly technical, like hydrology and meteorology. These are, are fields where people are dedicating their professional lives to studying, um, to developing methodologies, and, and, and most of them are incredibly complex. You know, it, it, it's not immediately accessible to most people. Um, but this is, these are all things that journalists have to, to understand. They have to digest themselves, and they have to be able to translate uh, to people, to their, to their media consumers. Um, so, you know, many of these fields, I think, also are, are the, the domain of academia. And, you know, the worlds of media and advanced applied research do not organically connect as often as, as we might like, you know. Um, this, this is even a challenge for, for somebody like me who's literally paid to consider water issues um, in accessing this research. You know, I mean, if it, I probably shouldn't say this on a, on a webinar being broadcast to the world, but you know, if it weren't for friends of mine who are, are very patient and generous and willing to, to share their university login accounts, um, and, and share research articles that I ask for, uh, I'd be stuck, you know, and I think that's the same for a lot of journalists. This, this work is often hidden behind paywalls, uh, and that's a, that's a real challenge, you know, um, and I don't care who, who hears that. So Elsevier, uh, Taylor Francis, Sage Publishing, if you want some, you can get it. I'm nice with these boys, um, fair warning. The list goes on, moving on. Uh, so CWE has been supporting journalists in a number of different ways. Um, I think a lot of these have been covered. I'm not sure that they're incredibly unique uh, when, when you're talking about the workshops that we've held versus those held by IHE or the NBI. Um, you know, I think what we're really looking to do is, is to make connections uh, between the journalists and experts within their field. We're trying to put sort of uh, cutting edge. Um, I, I think by this, I mean fresh new research, things that are, are crispy, things that might move the, the, the narrative around cooperation. We're trying to, to make sure that journalists have access to that essentially. Um, we've been trying to provide opportunities for journalists to write their own stories. Uh, we do this by, by taking journalists out on field visits. You know, I, I'm not sure if there, there's ever going to be as a, a field visit as significant as going out to the GERD, but I think, you know, part of the, the stories around cooperation are, are that, you know, this, the, the GERD is just one project. And once the GERD is, is completed and filled and operational, uh, whether there's an agreement or not, there's going to be uh, you know, a need for cooperation much, much longer beyond that. This, this river is, is binding for the countries. Uh, so Sorry, Carrie, having... I hate to interrupt, um, but yeah, we need to wrap it up a bit. Um, sure, yeah. sure. Um, strengthening the role of journalists in the new media landscape, I think is incredibly important, helping journalists um, better prepare themselves for, uh, you know, working online, working with different types of publications. And then, of course, I think, you know, something that can't be overlooked is the, developing a platform for journalists to, to work amongst themselves and, and sort of uh, become their own, own best resources. Um, we can probably pick up some of these lessons learned, I think, in the panel discussion. But one, one uh, just a few of these kind of overarching issues um, are that, you know, of course, a lot of these issues are very sensitive. Um, but, you know, good reporting can cut through that, honestly. Uh, there, there's a way to tell the story of Nile cooperation uh, professionally, with balance, with impartiality. Um, and and good, good journalists are out there doing that. So it's, it's definitely possible to have these conversations in the media. Um, in, a, in a positive and constructive way. Um, journalists face diverse challenges. Uh, we, we haven't gone into a lot of the challenges, not just related to Nile cooperation, but being a journalist in 2021 and what that means for a journalist, the things that they have to do uh, to remain competitive, to continue developing their own professional skill sets, uh, to have opportunity to publish their work. 
Um, I think another lesson learned is that journalists and decision makers have a lot in common. They need each other. Uh, decision makers need to be able to communicate their messages effectively. And there's no, no, no better outlet for that than through uh, res good responsible journalism. Uh, and a lot of this can be seen, you know, when it comes to the issue of fake news, which is uh, a huge topic uh, amongst the network that, that I'm working with. And I, I know many other journalists, um, you know, I, there, there's a forthcoming report from Brown University that suggests that on a daily basis, 25% of all tweets related to climate change uh, are, are generated by bots. And so to cut through all of that mess and to be able to accurately share the message, um, we need good journalists. And I think the people who follow journalism in denial um, know what's good and they pay attention to that. Um, and, and a saying from, from where I grew up, uh, real recognizes real. And I believe that, you know, so supporting good journalism uh, certainly has a place and, and is needed moving forward. That's all. Let's uh, let's let's continue to discuss in the um, in the conversation. If anybody wants to get a hold of me, my email address is right here. Uh, we have a lot of plans to continue supporting journalists. So if you are a journalist and you're all not already connected, please get at me. We have uh, we have business to discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kerry. Um, I hope. The journalists in the room have taken note as well of your, your email address. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll be delving into some of the uh, lessons learned, I think, a bit more in the panel discussion, which, in fact, I would uh, like to yeah jump into immediately. Um, thanks again to all our presenters. What we decided to do is actually to have the panel made up of uh, the same presenters, because I think um, now that we've all heard from one another, um, the plans uh, that are yeah sort of still in the pipeline, the work that has been done, but also the reflections that uh, each of the partners has given now in the presentations, I think still um, leaves a lot of uh, room for discussion. So I would like to ask all of our presenters slash panelists to um, yeah, just maybe turn on your camera again. We can keep the microphones muted uh, and, until uh, each and every one of us speaks. Um, yeah, but for now, just so we're all in the same space. Thank you very much. So after all of that, I would actually, uh, first of all, like to come back to uh, our very first presenter, um, who is Jane from, from NBI. Um, just because you were the first, uh, the first to speak to us, Jane, and now that we've had all these inputs and all these reflections uh, from other partners, um, I was wondering what your uh, perception now is of where you see common challenges, um, and that could better be addressed uh, jointly or sort of a, a Sarah, potential. Sarah, I'm not getting you. Sarah, sorry, oh, I, I don't know whether I should remove my stop. Uh, can someone just side, quickly confirm to me please, if please, it's on my side or Jane's? First, stop the video. Okay. All right, Jane, I hope you can hear me a bit better now. Yes, it's better. Thank you. Yes, because the, the question that I want to pose to you is, after all of uh, your colleagues' presentations, where do you see uh, common challenges that could better be addressed together? Um, so where do you see now for NBI, from, from your perspective, uh, a potential for closer collaboration or issues to pick up on? Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to thank my co-presenters. Um, I think there's a lot uh, that has come through uh, from which actually we could work together, the different organizations. Um, but talking about the challenges, the common challenges that I see, uh, one thing that struck me is the issue of um, having to reach far and wide with our messages, uh, with our support. Uh, for example, we have looked at the different work we are doing with the media. And um, one of the things that came out was that, for example, the nows, maybe uh, in terms of um, 
in terms of uh, the, the number of people that are reading it is limited, and yet there are very, very good stories within that publication. Um, uh, uh, we, we've heard from um, Frederick. I uh, also don't know how many people are really, they are, they are able to reach. So I'm thinking this is a common challenge because we also face it as MBI. Uh, so how can we work together as partners on reaching as many stakeholders as possible? There's the issue of language, because it's another thing that we are having a challenge with, at least as NBI. Frederick talked about uh, coordinators in the different countries that help with translating content in the, in the different languages. So uh, uh, for us, it is still a challenge as NBI, because our two official languages are French and English, and yet we have so many other people that we need to reach out to. So how can we work together as partners to, you know, to overcome the issue of language? A barrier that we are facing. So those are the two challenges I'd like to bring up as I also give opportunity to my colleagues to say something on that. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, maybe just because you also mentioned uh, the Niles again, and I know Nick had actually raised this uh, this challenge for the Niles as well in his presentation. Uh, I'm wondering, Nick, do you want to also quickly reflect on that point of maybe how to increase the reach and in, in, improve the, uh, yeah, the, the, the penetration of these, these topics essentially into um, yeah, the broader society in the Nile Basin? Thanks. <laughs> Well, if I would have an easy answer, I guess we would do it. Uh, it it's, it's really not that simple to answer. I, I guess one point that is rather straightforward. I mean, if we look at, uh, it was mentioned before, social media, it's a blessing and a curse at the same time. Um, we all have our channels, we try to serve. And that's one point to, you know, share the stories we all publish and, and, and try to get them on all social media channels through that. Eventually, I mean, we probably all have pretty much similar followers, but nonetheless, that's that's a very simple way forward. I think also in terms of diversifying the content, looking at the Niles, the newspaper compared to Info Nile, they have the long form stories. I think there we have a pretty good diversity already. But then if we think about the general public um, and, and let's picks you know the, the 11 countries we're, we're working in what what is the most widespread media that that people consume it's obviously radio um who of us really works in in the radio sector i mean we're focusing on on online we're focusing on print we're doing long form stories and through the collaboration with some of the journalists maybe we actually go into radio to some in one way or another but none of us is, is clearly focusing on that. So if we really want to reach many, many people, I think radio would be a very good option to choose. Um, and obviously, we, we, we know how people, and that is nothing related to, to Nile Basin, like many of the, the other issues that have been mentioned, like fake news, etc. But obviously, the attention span of people is very limited nowadays and you know there's so much information out there it's easy to get confused and how how can we get that people hooked to to really dive into this excellent stories we we all publish on the different channels um, from the experience in sudan and south sudan where we really were able to drive a lot of traffic to to our website is is videos like you know how, how can we maybe there further further the reach on, on social media, everyday and I uh, photography, good, good way forward, but also maybe include more video. That's what people consume. Um, and I think a very important topic, which we, we always tend to look at the journalist side, like at the sender side, but we never really look at the receiver side. And again, that is a global problem. We have completely failed for, for such a long time to really uh, work on media literacy. How can we you know, advance that, that people actually, this great content we're producing, how do we make sure that people actually understand it? How do we help them to distinguish what's, what's fake, what's not fake? And, I think this is an issue we obviously can't really address as media practitioners, but I think that is something, for example, for the NBI to look at, like 
you know, maybe go more in schools and start there already. How, how do people understand this night based in this courses and help them to, to understand them actually better? Thank you, Nick. Uh, I think you're bringing up a very interesting point there that uh, it's also important to, yeah, consider the, the receiving end uh, and media literacy um, sort of being being a topic there. So I think Jane will be taking note of those suggestions. Um, I mean, if, if anyone else wants to jump in on a question, please uh, let me know at any stage. But uh, given the limited time, I would like to also still cover a couple of other um, points. And I think uh, Emmanuel was the one who um, already kind of touched on this as well, uh, making some well, or give, giving an idea of, of what he thinks uh, still remains in terms of skill and information gaps uh, in the Nile Basin, or sorry, amongst the media network, let's say, in the Nile Basin. Um, so following, again, the presentations from, from the other partners, Emmanuel, um, would you like to reflect on, on what you think, in your opinion, is still something that needs intervention, active intervention, active support uh, from development partners or from the NBI. Thanks. Um, thank you. Uh, also, building up on what uh, Dominic and Jane said, I think, so if I have to identify a, a priority uh, in terms of support, uh, for me, the priority especially in, in building the, the capacity, both of the journalists, but starting there from our own organization and institutions would be to learn how to better work um, with social media within the digital world, as I, as I said before. I think, especially nowadays, that everything eh, takes place in the, in the digital world, in these two dimension world, I think we need to be to better equip ourselves eh, to learn how to strategically uh, be present in those spaces. Um, for instance, eh, when we say we need to enla enlarge the, the conversation, we, reach, we need to reach a bigger um, audience, public, which are the key uh, instrument that we can use, which are the key messages. For instance, Dominic mentioned a video. I think Instagram, uh, again, is something eh, that can reach uh, a huge um, public for a few seconds. You you scroll up, down the a photo, and that's all. Eh? It's just uh, an emotion. The long read, long reading form, uh, the podcast, those are for a small community. Uh, people like uh, uh, the participants add to this network. So there I'm not particularly worried if I don't have big numbers, but I think, so I think we need to be, first of all, strategic. And second, we need to equip ourselves on how to work, how to be present in, um, in the social network, in different social network and how to use these different channels uh, to reach different audiences and perhaps also to convey different messages. And I think we all, uh, and we need those capacities, first of all, within our uh, own organization, because I'm feeling uh, the people who are much better <laughs> at this than, uh, than us. So I think that would be my first priority. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Um, and yeah, in interesting point there on not everything has to reach the masses, right? We do have some, some specialist uh, communication formats uh, where it's very fine to reach out to and maybe uh, also enshrine a smaller community of practitioners. 
um, yeah, maybe as w one example, because I know um, InfoNile has actually managed to get quite a lot of exposure. Um, Frederick, you've had a couple of publications, a couple of uh, actually quite uh, in-depth uh, investigative uh, reporting formats um, that have been republished by many different media houses. Um, maybe, uh, yeah, is, is there something you would like to reflect uh, on from, from that point of view as well, just now after hearing what Emmanuel was saying uh, on yeah, reaching out to bigger numbers, not necessarily always being the right uh, the right thing. But I, I think the stories you guys have have been picking on um, have have been interesting because they're very usually very localized stories, but telling a, a, a bigger story of now cooperation. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Um, I, I want to start it from uh, what Nick said. Um, the use of uh, other uh, channels uh, like radio. We had a project uh, uh, which, which, which we uh, soon completing that uh, paired journalists, a radio, radio journalists and a print or TV journalists, a radio journalists based in the rural community and uh, TV or you know, print journalists based in uh, urban areas to tell the story of COVID and the water challenge. We are looking at COVID and you know how it has affected the uh, community that already had the challenge of water shortage. And uh, we you know, supported over 20 journalists in the region you know, who uh, told these stories and they were perfect stories. We got amazing feedback from the audience, from rural communities. You know, these radio guys were based in rural communities and they were able now you know, to uh, tell uh, challenges that we communities are facing, you know, as COVID sets in and with, you know, water shortage. So it is very important also to think of, you know, uh, such, uh, you know, uh, channels that go deep down to communities uh, uh, that are affected. This way it will attract the audience, the, you know, the audience in rural communities and, you know, policymakers and, you know, uh, 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 other um, uh, audience. But also another point I wanted to contribute is that it's very important to, to I, I don't know, but you know, to train or to make sure that the diplomats and the you know, politicians uh, uh, understand the media and how it works. And, you know, yeah. So this way, the journalists will not find a problem getting the story. Sometimes we look at journalists and we think maybe they're not giving us the stories. And you know, when these journalists go to the field, they don't get these stories because the the the, the diplomats, the uh, the scientists, the researchers are holding on to their stories. They don't want to give it to us as journalists. And then you, as a journalist, you have nothing to tell. You 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 realize. So it's very important for for us, uh, for organizations like NBI to. Kind of train or sensitize the diplomats and you know, scientists and such as to work with journalists. Yeah, so this way we'll have more stories and, and then we'll create big impacts. And remember, these stories will be supported with facts from researchers, from diplomats, not just the stories that you know journalists deal with, you no know, facts, and sometimes they are not factual. Yeah. Great, thanks a lot, uh, Frederick. And I, I think that's a an interesting point also, Emmanuel, I'm sure that resonates with you on working also with the, with the scientists. Uh, I, I know this course of, uh, yeah, on, on science communication does exactly that. We've also, I know with uh, the MICT network have tried to, of course, always bring in scientists um, and sort of also give input on, on how to, yeah, how, how, how to present the information also to journalists, how to work back and forth with journalists uh, engaging in, in, in that process, I think is definitely also more of a relationship, not just a feeding of, of information, ideally, right? So, yeah, very interesting. Um, again, just with a view to time, I would uh, still like to maybe think about or have, have us think about one of the key uh, questions of, of this webinar um, that we wanted to address and that is really of how NBI and uh, development partners 
um, are able to better coordinate uh, their efforts. Now, I, I already had a bit of side discussions with uh, some of you, and I know, um, for example, Kerry is quite keen to talk on this. Um, so with, with that, I would like to yeah, give the floor to Kerry, please. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, you know, I think coordination is, is definitely an important part of it. Um, all donors know that they need to coordinate. It's the easiest thing in the world to get a donor to admit the need for coordination. Um, but actually seeing that happen is a, is a different story. You know, it, it requires effort. And I think that's, you know, that's an undercurrent for everything regarding transboundary water cooperation. You know, we have this, this notion that, um, and, and this is supported, of course, by history, that, that humanity tends to cooperate over water uh, as opposed to resorting to some sort of conflict. Um, but that's not automatic. And we can't sort of, as, um, as responsible citizens anywhere in the world we find ourselves, uh, just rely on that notion. You know, it takes actual effort. And so I think that's one of the things, as I mentioned, with the Shared Waters Partnership, you know, this is a mechanism that's designed to, to help donors coordinate their efforts. Um, so that's, that's one aspect. But I think, you know, another part of this is that this work and really, you know, transboundary water cooperation in general, um, sort of a, as seen through the lens of the donor community, it really straddles the lines between uh, development support and diplomatic support. And so um, I, I don't think that there's a very comfortable or natural place for, for support to journalism in this way to really sort of fit in, um, in, in in different ways. I mean, development work, for example, is very metrically driven. You know, it's how, how many journalists did you train? Um, how many workshops did you have? Uh, and and all, all of that's important, but, you know, especially when it comes to something, you know, the outputs of journalism, of course, they, they, they should be objective. All, you know, reporting is an objective medium, but, um, you know, the, it, it's qualitative at the same time. And so to, to really support that, I think it's, it's, it's important for the development partner community to know the value and to, and to know the role that, that media um, has been playing, can play, what the potential of that is, and to support these kinds of projects. And I think, uh, you know, as Jane mentioned uh, in her introduction with the Nile Basin Development Forum Media Awards, um, Siwi, Siwi was uh, fortunate uh, enough to be included in, and join the jury. And, and through the assessment, um, the assessment of all of the entries this year, it really became apparent how fantastic these platforms like the Niles and Info Nile are um, to provide that home for this type of investigative journalism, um, this long form journalism, a place where, uh, you know, journalists can really sort of pursue uh, the, the types of interesting stories that I think, um, you know, describe cooperation essentially. And so ha having those types of opportunities, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong Nick, but the, the Niles was, I think you said started in 2017. Basically, I know that, you know, it was a, a long evolution to, to get there, but I think in, in a relatively short time, these types of platforms have become an amazing home uh, for this type of work. And so finding a way for, uh, the development partner community, who's divided amongst development agencies, foreign policy agencies, to recognize the value and to continue supporting that. Um, and I think, you know, the experience from Siwi shows that this type of support can have um, fantastic sort of one-time uh, results, uh, as was the case with our initial 2016 workshop. Um, you know, that went to the GERD, but it also can continuously supporting um, media because the, the story of cooperation is evolving. Uh, it's, it, it hasn't ended in, in denial and, and it won't end, you know, whether that comes with a GERD agreement or not, cooperation will go on. Uh, so it's, it's always going to be of value to see good journalism, to support good journalism, um, and, and to keep, keep promoting those journalists 
who are really actively working towards um, telling the story and telling it in, in the best way that they can. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kerry. Um, and yeah, I think this is definitely a conversation that we'll have to also continue uh, well beyond this, this webinar. I, I think for me, one of the values now of the discussion was also to see, just kind of get an update on, on what everyone is doing, is planning. Um, and I think in so many areas, our, um, our visions and our work align uh, very strongly. So we do have uh, one hand raised uh, amongst participants right now. Um, oh, it just went away again. Oh no, yes. And that is uh, by Bassem, one of our, the journalists I think a lot of us have already worked uh, with in the past. Um, so with that, I would ask the technical team to please give him the floor for one sort of final question for the panel, please. Thanks, Basim. Whenever you're ready, I can see you're still muted, but you'll be able to speak now. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I uh, hope all of you are fine and safe. Um, uh, my name is Bessem Abbas. I'm an Egyptian journalist working for Jean's France Press uh, based in Cairo. And um, uh, thank you all for your uh, great uh, presentation. Uh, uh, and uh, I just want to uh, address a few points uh, out of the presentations. And uh, um, hopefully uh, uh, these points could be uh, a bit helpful uh, for, uh, uh, for the coordinators and the organizers. Um, uh, first of all, um, what Emanuele said and mentioned the social media and the importance of social media as an influencing tool is very important. And um, uh, my addition in that, uh, that, uh, that I, I'd like to uh, uh, um, uh, vote for a fact check, Nile fact check uh, uh, generator or application that could be attached to the social media just to avoid the, uh, the amount of uh, false information and news uh, that are spreading over the social media and the uh, platforms. So this fact check will be so helpful for the journalists and the public that are demanding information on the Nile uh, River uh, with all the references uh, provided. Of course, uh, this will build more trust uh, rather than capacity first, uh, uh, which is my next point, uh, building capacity. Uh, uh, I think uh, now after... Um, uh, maybe uh, um, since I have joined the workshops of uh, MBI uh, uh, six years now, uh, I think we are uh, a little bit back into uh, the square one of building trust. Uh, maybe because the, the year that the people stayed at home uh, affected them a bit negatively, uh, uh, caused frustration, depression. So uh, that uh, turned out on the uh, social media and on the in some opinion pieces um, uh, to be uh, 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 affecting the relationship between the journalists themselves. Uh, to, be, uh, to be more clear, um, everyone in this world, um, uh, in, if, if you just switch down the, the, the button of uh, patriotism or nationalism, nationalism uh, you could, you know, like you could hear tons of words uh, defending the countries, the interests of the countries, the basin, but this is is completely opposing to 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 the the, the concept of the journalist. Because when you when you are a journalist, you are simply reporting the right and the correct, uh, despite the place or 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 or, or wherever you are belonging to. So that's that's we are want to focus on. That's to report the right and the correct uh, information, uh, um, uh, um, uh, even if it will if it will be contrary to your country interests. But but it's honesty and transparency, and this is the job of the journalist. My third point, and I will not be uh, uh, so uh, I will not take a long time. Is my third point is uh, the uh, podcast and the radio, as uh, Nick and Emmanuel mentioned. Is, is very, very, very smooth and easy tool 
to uh, to uh, to enlarge our reach out of audience. And um, uh, I, I I wonder um, since uh, 2010 or 11 when Nick mentioned that the denials uh, had read you. I think if 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 the if the experience uh, um, gets to be repeated uh, or uh, reconsidered uh, to have a podcast or radio. Um, uh, uh, Niles and uh, the Niles podcast or radio. I think uh, this could give us um, uh, a great, greater opportunity to uh, to share more information and more stories uh, uh, with the audience uh, through that platform. Um, uh, uh, the last thing, uh, the source book uh, that uh, Jane mentioned. I think that could could work uh, perfectly with the with the fact check uh, um, uh, app that I want to uh, that I wanted to mention at the beginning. So thank you all, and uh, hope you have a great day. Thank you so much for that input, Basim. Uh, so I, I didn't pick up on any uh, questions now for the panel, um, but I think all of us were keenly uh, listening to uh, to your reflections uh, from the, the journalist side, of course, um, and also the ideas. I mean, uh, fact-checking tools have been popping up uh, increasingly all around the world for different topics. Um, and I think for the Nile, it's uh, yeah, also one of the most relevant areas where fact checks are needed. I know NBI has also been talking about sort of, yeah, doing the, the common common misrepresentations, common factual errors, um, having sort of a, yeah, almost a fact sheet on, on that kind of uh, issue. But I think, yeah, we'll definitely have a conversation about how to, um, how to address that, integrate that and pick on that idea. Thank you so much for your input. Um, with that, we are actually now also out of time. Uh, I know this conversation, as I say, will continue. I think this is only the beginning. Um, we do have still some uh, uh, questions in the Q&A and I would ask, uh, maybe our panelists to just uh, check the Q&A and see if there's something uh, that you can address to address that in writing, because I would like to take the time to thank all of our presenters slash panelists for the discussion today. Um, I do know Jane wanted to make a quick announcement before we have our colleague Liz uh, give sort of the, the summary of the session um, and the key takeaways. So yeah, Jane, over to you and then we'll have the summary from our colleague uh, Liz. Thank you. Jane, are you? Are you still with us? We can hear you right now. Oof, okay, uh, then let's maybe start with uh, with Liz um, with our summary, and then we can see if if Jane can uh, yeah reconnect uh, or. or speak to us just after the summary. Liz, over to you, please. Um, thank you, Sarah. Uh, am I audible? Can I be heard? Yes, you are, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I cannot share my video because my bandwidth uh, cannot support that. Otherwise, it would just go off. Uh, so, <clears throat> a good Afternoon, everybody. I'm called Elizabeth Aguirre. I handle media relations at the N NBI Secretariat. Uh, now we'll start off with, um, we had Malte uh, from JZ who had the opening remarks. And in these opening remarks, um, <clears throat> he emphasized the role of the media and how they they contribute to forming opinion on the Nile. And this uh, prepares ground for countries to move into deeper cooperation. And then um, what he said is what they do in recognition of the media, the German government through GIZ is actually support the media. And this has been through the Nile Media Awards as you've listened to uh, presentations on that. Um, 
the Nile Media Awards. This is now the third. This year is going to be the third edition of that. And the purpose of this webinar is actually to facilitate exchange between partners to share their experiences and explore potential areas for cooperation and support of the media because of the, the important role that they play um, in, in covering issues on cooperation. Uh, so the challenge for the media is to bring different sides of cooperation yeah, not just voices of musicians, religious leaders, and also the common uh, citizens. This was Mal these were in Malta's remarks. So then we had a presentation from Jane. Uh, Jane is the communications and uh, stakeholder engagement specialist at the Secretariat, whose presentation was on creating and enabling. So here she talked about some of the activities that the NBI has engaged in in, um, in supporting constructive reporting on Nile cooperation. One of those is uh, the media content analysis. She went into this uh, details about this, how it enhances understanding of coverage of issues and uh, enables factual reporting because with that we're able to pick out uh, errors that are um, that have been made in the publication and then point these out to the different journalists. She mentioned different other activities that we do in setting the narrative, the journalist source book that's going to help um, journalists get reference to get clarity on, on different uh, complex issues. Uh, NBI has built capacity of journalists in different, um, uh, different countries, actually bringing all the countries, all the uh, journalists from the different uh, Nile Basin countries together and then um, creating incentives like uh, the Nile Media Awards uh, which I've already mentioned. Um, another thing is uh, engaging media ahead of events. Those are breakfast meetings, press conferences, uh, press releases, all these enable in, <clears throat> in setting the narrative. Uh, then we had Nick from MICT, who's talking about building bridges through joint reporting. One of the issues that came out strongly in his um, uh, presentation was the coordination, the collaboration that they've had with the different journalists in the different countries. They've coached over 160 journalists over the years since they started. Um, they've trained all these uh, journalists on different topics so they can better understand these um, complex issues and report on them better, environmental resources and conservation. They recently had a training on, on dams and dam cascading. And on all these topics, they've gone ahead to publish um, uh, publish uh, uh, articles in, in, in the Niles, uh, which uh, he says, well, hasn't had much reach, but something that they're working on. Um, and, and one of the issues that he's highlighted while working with the journalists is, is a lack of depth in reporting. And this is one of the things that they're trying to, to, to solve by getting them in touch with different experts, by integrating data into, into their reports, and basically trying to cooperate more with, um, with other organizations to, to reduce the environmental footprint. Uh, we had Emmanuel, <clears throat> um, IHE Delft, who talked about um, the techniques that they're using their organization uh, to, to, to reach different circles of audiences. And he, you've, um,
sorry, I think you lost me there for a bit. Uh, my network is not so good. Uh, but we've got um, Emmanuel. Yeah, we are, you're, you're back now, Liz. Um, and could um, I ask you to maybe just pick w one or two key takeaways uh, per, per um, presentation or presentation. Even, even overall, huh? just because we are running out of time a bit. Thank you. Yes. Okay, the overall message that came out from all these presentations is the need for cooperation, cooperation among uh, the development partners to train these journalists, to support them, to, to, to increase the funding, to, to, to help them um, report better about the different issues that are affecting the Nile Basin. And um, <clears throat> that has also come out through in the panel discussion um, where one of the challenges that came out is, is reach. And, and Nick's decision, rather Nick's uh, suggestion on, on that is that the radio is a very good medium to reach um, a wider audience in, 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 in the basin because the radio is actually the most common uh, medium of, of, of communication for them, these local communities, how do we reach them? So communication through radio, strengthening cooperation between the different partners to support journalists, those have been uh, the big takeaways for me uh, coming from this, uh, this webinar. Thank you, Sarah. Okay. Thank you so much, Liz. Um, I know that's not an easy, easy task, uh, summarizing yeah. a two hour webinar in, <laughs> in five, 10 minutes. So um, thanks a lot for that. Uh, I just was wondering if Jane is back with us. Jane, do you have a better connection now? You still wanted to say some, some closing words as well. Jane, no. Okay. Then um, maybe let me thank everyone also on Jane's behalf. I'm sure she wanted to thank everyone for their inputs as well. Um, again, to our, our presenters uh, and panelists for the great discussion, great ideas, uh, but also to all of our uh, participants um, yeah, for, for joining this webinar, for the questions asked in the Q&A, uh, for the inputs given and the ideas given. And as I say, I think this is the beginning of a discussion, definitely not the end. Um, on that note, all that remains is for me to wish you all a lovely day. Uh, some of the people in the uh, yeah, in, in the participant group, I know I'll be speaking to again a bit later. Um, but yeah, thanks a lot for everyone's interest and everyone's participation. Have a great day. Bye.